Volunteering with Wildlife Act, Part 2. This is Paulette Struckman of Santa Catalina School in Monterey, California. My first monitoring experience were four wild cheetah, before I even arrived at the Tanda Private Game Reserve. There were two on each side of a fence, all four were male cheetah posturing at each other. Clearly, they were territorial, and it was fun to watch them. This is the camp at Intaban on the Tanda Private Game Reserve in Zululand. I stayed in an A-frame house with a thatch roof. There was electricity and intermittent running water. There was no fence around the camp, which meant that wildlife could wander through freely. Giraffe were a frequent visitor, and I always felt safe when the giraffe were there because I knew they were keeping an eye on me. Well, not really on me, they were actually keeping an eye out for the lions, which were also known to be at the edge of, or actually, inside of camp. Um, the wildebeest were also fairly good sentinels. When neither were present, you knew you had to keep an extra special eye out to see if there were lions in the area. Here are two of the northern pride males sleeping on the hill overlooking our camp. This is as close as I saw them during the day. The next pictures are all of things that I saw from my balcony. Our days always started before sunrise. Many animals are most active in the pre-dawn hours, or just around dusk. The water hole at Intaban Pan, which was kept filled with a pump, was one of the wonderful places to actually see lots of wildlife, particularly around dawn. We saw many interesting animals drinking from it. Birchall zebra. Blue wildebeest, also known as new. <laughs> Southern Giraffe. And of course, Lion. While I enjoyed seeing the lions at the waterhole, it was way too close to the wild dogs. That's where the, their den was not far down the hill, and if the lions had discovered it, they would have wiped out every single one of the 15 pups. And as many of the adults as they could have managed. The African wild dog is endangered, while the lion is not. The lion views it as a predator, and therefore as competition. In the mornings, we would always monitor the wild dog den. In the afternoons, we might also monitor the wild dogs, uh, because, especially because of the pups and the interactions, as discussed in part one. However, we would also do other things in the afternoon, including monitoring the cheetahs. Notice the quick respiration rate. These cheetah have eaten so much at their last meal that it has compressed 
the space that their lungs can take up, and so they have to take quick, rapid, shallow breaths. These are the two male cheetahs, Phil and Rusty, Phil with the collar. We would locate them with radio telemetry. While out on our morning and afternoon drives, we would see a lot of other interesting wildlife. For example, these kudu. This marabou stork is actually a scavenger, rather like a vulture. New World vultures are actually related to storks. Old World vultures, such as this white-backed vulture, are related to raptors. These were also a species of interest, and we would record them when sighted. Or heard, guinea fowl make quite a racket. You can tell this is an adult male Niala by the orange socks he has. There are many different species of eagle, and I saw eagles almost every day I was in Africa. This is a tawny eagle. Warthogs are a perennial favorite. The brown hooded kingfisher are also quite beautiful. About once a week, we would go to the office and enter the data onto a computer. While we were there, we also had internet access. One day on the way to the office, we heard about a wildfire on the community land next door. So we went to fight it to prevent it from reaching the Tonda Private Game Reserve. They do allow burns on the reserve, but it's on a plan, a seven-year plan that cycles through the area. This burn was probably started naturally, although there have been other burns set by poachers.
the poachers aren't really after the elephants, they're after game meat. And since the fences have been taken down along the district road, they have easy access to hunt. Typically, they put out snares for things like impala, but they can catch other animals, and in fact killed one lion a few weeks before we were there. This unbalanced the dynamics of the pride, and his brother was driven out by a coalition of other males. He was driven out of the game reserve and into an area adjacent to the community land, which could have caused problems. So, unfortunately, one part of conservation is that you have to try to recapture this lion using bait, including the impala and the warthog shown here. He was eventually caught in the Zululand Rhino Reserve. He is currently in a boma and must be fed until they decide his fate. He will either be shot or relocated to a no home, hopefully the latter. This is one of the unpleasant sides of conservation. One of the most fun parts of the job was to be monitoring the hyena because that required night drives where we went out with a spotlight and we tried to locate Malcolm, who was a collared hyena. We never found Malcolm, but we did find other hyenas. We heard Malcolm, but uh, he hid himself in a drainage line. Unfortunately, I can't get great photos at night, but some of them came out kind of interestingly, including this one of the small spotted genet. I had uh, one afternoon off while I was at Tonda, and I went to the Bayeti Zulu Elephant Interaction Experience, where you had a chance to actually interact, touch, feed um, two elephants who are, in fact, habituated to humans. They're not technically tame, but it was uh, quite an interesting experience. What did After completing two weeks at Tonda, I went to the Tembe Elephant Park, which, unlike the private game reserve of Tonda, is a community-owned park in Zululand, very far north on the border of Mozambique. They are known for actually having the largest elephants in the world. This fellow isn't even the biggest. I stayed at the research camp inside Tempe Elephant Park. This camp was fenced, unlike the one at Tonda, and so the only wildlife inside it were animals like the vervet monkeys which you had to be very careful of because if they got in the kitchen, it could be quite a disaster. This is a view from the top of the beacon, just looking out over Tembe Elephant Park. We would sometimes go up here to find signals of distant lions. Much of Tembe is an ecosystem known as a sand forest. One of the most important animals here is an in, or group of insects known as dung beetles, which are detritivores, and they break down the dung and recycle it. They are hugely important to the nutrient cycling of the system. And there are many, many different types of dung beetles, over 70 in Tembe Park alone. The day at Tembe started before dawn. We began with a swamp check where we 
we used radio telemetry to search for the lions. Six months of the year, the local community people come in to harvest reeds from the swamp, but they need to know that the lions aren't there before they will come in and harvest. And it's a major source of income for these people. During my first swamp check, I got to see an interesting encounter between lions and Cape buffalo. However, not all lions are radio collared, like this sub-adult male. Some of these we would find simply because they were walking down the road. Our swamp check was not a guarantee that there were no lions, simply that we had not located any of the collared lions. Mufasa is one of our radio collared lions and one we frequently found in the area of the swamp. This is radio telemetry. Here I'm demonstrating the use of long range telemetry looking for very weak signals. And then if you find a weak signal, you can try to find it and localize it by turning it horizontally in order to be able to find the strongest signal. You always do a complete signal because sometimes you can be getting what are called back signals, which are essentially echoes coming from behind you. However, the signal from the direction the line is actually in is typically a lot stronger. But you always need to check your back signal to be sure. Our lion monitoring was not limited to simply the swamp check. We would look for lions at other times of the day as well, and we would monitor their locations and any interactions that we witnessed. 
the Lions in Tembi don't have a traditional pride structure. There are two competing theories as to why this might be. One of them is that there's simply such a high prey density that they don't need to be able to hunt together as a large group. They can catch prey easily on their own or in pairs. The competing theory is that is that it is an effect of the contraceptives that are in use. The contraceptives act for a period of three years, and so perhaps without the young cubs to hold the group together, perhaps that is why the, they are no longer forming true prides. They do hang out together, but they switch who they're with at different times. Um, this male, Langa, has a tendency to be hanging out with some of the subadult males right now and he's often found at the same location at Tembu Crossing at around dawn on many days of the week. The females, however, are being fickle, sometimes hanging out with Mufasa, sometimes with Langa. Um, we believe that Kampa, who actually has been contracepted, uh, may actually be pregnant anyway. So we've got some kinks to work out in this whole contraceptive business. One thing one of the vets is working on right now is um, a way of removing one ovary while in the field so that you can have the number of lines that are born but perhaps not interfere with the pride structure because there would still be cubs born every year, just only half as many. Here in the pictures where the lions look like they are snarling, they're actually lifting up their lip so that they can uh, sense the pheromones from the scent marks of the other cats. Um, Langa, the male here, is very much interested in one of the females, but she's not quite so interested in him. In 2002, four lions were reintroduced into the Tembi Elephant Park. Kampa, the large female on the right, is one of the originals. The community supported the reintroduction of lions into Tembi because they wanted to make it into a Big Five park, that is, a park that contains elephant, rhino, Cape Buffalo, Lion, and Leopard. They're hoping for an increased income due to the tourism to Tembi Park as a result of this. As a community-owned park, all the decisions have to be made in consultation with the local Induna, which are basically the chiefs of the local tribes, as well as the Zulu King. Generally, Tembi is a model example of cooperation between conservation and the local people. Since the reintroduction in 2002, the number of lions has grown significantly and there are concerns about inbreeding. They are intending to introduce a new pair of male lions in order to improve the gene pool. However, that means others must be taken out. Mufasa, who was shown earlier, is unfortunately scheduled to be shot. They were unable to find a home for him, and the, his hide has been promised to the Zulu king. It can be very difficult to find a home for uh, male lions, and if you have too many in one area, then because of the competition between the males, some may be forced to flee, like the one in Tanda. And if you can't find a home for them, unfortunately, they need to be destroyed, because there simply is not enough space for all of them. This is why the contraceptive work is so important. Lions, however, are not the only dangers to the people harvesting the reeds inside of Tembi Park. Probably even more dangerous are the Cape Buffalo. Indeed, one woman was uh, put into a coma while I was there, although she is now expected to live. There are also elephants and rhino in the reeds, which are also highly dangerous animals. So. Our swamp check checks for lions, but it is not a guarantee of safety. During one morning swamp check, I witnessed this very interesting optical effect, which looks like a white rainbow. I presume it's coming from a diffuse effect of sunlight through the mist, um, changing the lighting of the rainbow. Other interesting animals that you can sometimes see are the steenbok, which is a small antelope, uh, the white rhino, and the black rhino. However, I did not definitely sight any black rhinos, although I might have seen one running away. Black rhinos have a tendency to either run away or to become very aggressive. This is a reed buck.
This is a Birchall's Kugel. This is a tawny eagle in the mud. I presume it was drinking from the uh, water there at Tembu Crossing. This is a red diker. This is a fleeing gray or common diker. This is an adult male bush buck. This is a bushbuck fawn. This is a Samango monkey. This is a purple crested Taraco, otherwise known as a lorry. Hidden in the bush is a side strike jackal. In the afternoons, we also sometimes cared for the wild dogs in the boma. So the fence around here keeps them in. There are some new pups at the den. The dogs have to be fed about every other day every three days when they didn't have pups. This is the very first sighting of the pups at the den. In the afternoons, we would also often go elephant monitoring. This is Pawini Hyde above a waterhole. Pawini Hyde is above a natural waterhole here, which contains water almost year-round. Water, however, is provided at uh, some of the pans and at Malasella Hyde. Lots of other creatures can be seen at the waterhole, including this water monitor lizard. This Niala is marking his territory using a scent gland located on his face. This is a bush buck and a virtual zebra. Note the crocodile in the back. 
the crocodile had been relocated from the community land where it had been preying upon chickens. It's now about two meters in length. On cooler days, we would drive around looking for elephants because they wouldn't necessarily be near the water because they wouldn't be needing to cool off. One day we were lucky enough to get to see a rock python, another species that we got to record. These niala are posturing at each other in a territorial display. This is one of the elephants that's going to be featured in the upcoming book on the Big Tuskers of Africa. This is a black-chested snake eagle.
This cattle egret is eating a snake, if you look carefully. These impala are sparring. It's not yet a real fight, but there certainly is dominance being displayed here. The one on the right wins. We assisted the elephant monitor, Leonard. Primarily our job was to simply locate the elephants, which sometimes was easier said than done. Currently there are about twice the number of elephants on Tembi as was originally planned. However, they're not planning on changing this because they are hoping to drop the fence with the nearby park across the border in Mozambique. There have been some serious poaching problems there, however, and the Trans Frontier Park will not actually open until the poaching has gotten, been gotten under control. It may be necessary to introduce some contraception into the elephant herds here. Hopefully culling will not be necessary. Rachel and Rambo at the Bayeti Zulu Elephant Encounter are products of an improperly done culling. There were originally three of them, one of them had to be shot because he was uncontrollable. Rambo has escaped several times when he was in must, basically the male equivalent of being in estrus. They are very dangerous at this time. Although hand-reared, Rachel and Rambo are still effectively wild elephants, but they also can't be part of a wild herd. Here you can see a smaller elephant yielding to a display of dominance by a larger elephant by moving out of the way. Drivers must also yield to the elephants because the elephants are perfectly capable of completely destroying a vehicle. They are probably the most dangerous animal on the reserve although not the most unpredictable. That would be the Cape Buffalo. Or perhaps the Black Rhino. Here are two of the big tuskers together at the water hole at Milosella Hyde.
This wound was caused by another elephant's tusk. The three breeding herds here began stampeding away from the distant call of a lion's roar. One young elephant accidentally went with the wrong herd, but I was able to witness that a older juvenile from the second herd escorted him back to his proper herd and then returned. The whole time all the elephants were responding to the distress call of the poor young baby elephant. Bull elephants, after the age of 15 or so, are sent away from the herd, and they are only welcomed back when there are females in estrus. The most exciting thing that I got to participate in were lion call-ups, where we took prey animals that had been shot and broadcast distract signals in order to attract the lions to them so that the lions could then be darted by a licensed vet. All of the animals were examined and then the young ones were branded so that we could tell them apart. Uh, they were microchipped and several of them were also radio collared. Some of the older lions had radio collars replaced including one lion who had a radio collar replaced with a GPS collar. So we'll be able to track his movements more carefully. The vet involved was also an honorary officer of the Tembe Elephant Park. During the three lion call-ups in which I was involved, we located at least eight more lions than the park thought they had. All of these lions are subadults. We did not find one of the collared females whose collar I believe is dead, the batteries are dead, and there are two other adult uncollared females. These three might also have cubs, so the possible total could be even higher than the 34. We now can account for. The lions come to the bait and are allowed to eat for a while, and then they are darted. In this case, the mother was darted first because the uh, subadults were very unlikely to leave her, and that would make it easier for us to actually dart all of the lions. In one case, there was one subadult female that we did not successfully dart.
at our first site. This is the darting of one of the adult females.